I have always been fascinated with fighting games. They're flashy, they're nuanced, they exude style. They take countless hours of practice to break into, and once you do, your skill is on display for everyone to see. But I'm also intrigued by the culture surrounding them, the moments that emerge from EVO tournaments, and the story behind games such as Street Fighter II. Fighting games have a devout community and a rich history, and I've always enjoyed observing both from a distance. But that's just the thing. I've always been an observer, an outsider looking in. I've dabbled in countless fighting games and watched my fair share of tournament highlights, yet I never found a game that reeled me in, encouraged me to practice, eased me into its mechanics in a way that I personally found effective. In many ways, I was waiting for something like Injustice 2. When it comes to video games, the word accessibility has attracted a few stigmas. It's sometimes seen as a red flag to devoted fans that a developer or a publisher may be more concerned with sales than depth of design, casting a wider net to make a game many people will like rather than a game a handful of people will love. I'm reminded of Diablo 3 in 2012. When it released, many fans of the earlier games derided the sequel. To hear some tell it, developer Blizzard had gone too far in making the franchise accessible, dumbing down the systems and mechanics, so to speak, to draw more players into the action RPG. I happen to adore Diablo 3, but many fans found it to be a shallow representation of the series they were so fond of. Look also at a more recent title. Created in partnership between Halo developer 343 Industries and the RTS veterans at Creative Assembly, Halo Wars 2 has a bit of an identity problem. Is it a simple strategy game created for Halo fans, or a superficial Halo game made for RTS players? I recently returned to it, and I'm still struck by how uncertain the whole thing feels. I love Halo, and I love RTS games, but in trying to satisfy both camps as much as possible, 343 and Creative Assembly release really something that doesn't accomplish either. But now we have Injustice 2, and with it, a shining example of accessibility done right. You know, like the old days. The old days were fun, but these days I'm all business. As someone who has started myriad fighting games before ditching them hours later, Injustice 2 began on a familiar note. I jumped into a tutorial, learned the basic light, medium, and heavy attacks, how to block enemy advances, and how to combo all of this together. Then I learned things more specific to the Injustice series, hero powers, super moves, and the wager-based clash system, to name a few. Try a little tenderness? Not while I'm in beast mode. And then, as is usually the case, Injustice 2 taught me more complex mechanics than I could keep track of at once. Meter burns, block escapes, cross-ups, delayed get-ups, move cancels. It all blended together, and I remembered why I was hesitant to begin the game in the first place. I didn't have the time to learn all of these mechanics, and with so many other great games to catch up on, I was ready to give up. But then, the tutorial ended. I spent a few minutes exploring the menus. I scrolled through the roster. And in an effort to give it one more chance, I jumped into the game's story mode. The opening cinematic was fantastic, the first few fights let me sample several characters, and the campy plot drew me into the weird world of DC Comics. And if you know much about Injustice 2 by this point, then you know I gained loot throughout my early hours. New pieces of gear for different characters, whether it's a new bow for the Green Arrow or a different chest plate for Aquaman. They grant basic stat changes for strength, health, and defense, and in some cases, offer passive abilities for use in various Injustice 2 modes. But they also change how these iconic heroes look. And I realize that on the surface, this is a simple thing to enjoy. Seeing Superman in jagged, sinister armor, or Batman wearing a red suit. But as time goes on, these characters morph the more you use them. And more importantly, they can look extremely different from one player to the next. This results in an empowering sense of ownership. The more you play one character and learn their intricacies, the more likely you are to morph their appearance. Your max level Scarecrow becomes not just a new aesthetic variation, but a source of pride. You have a high tolerance, but everyone has something to fear. The introduction of RPG progression into other genres is nothing new at all. Call of Duty 4 introduced this to mainstream shooters with its loadout system, setting a precedent for multiplayer games today. Assassin's Creed Brotherhood let you further shape your protagonist and upgrade fellow assassins as well. And more recently, Titanfall 2 made a similar departure, ditching the burn card system of its predecessor for a more personalized progression tree. Many games use role-playing characteristics just for the sake of added content, or keeping players hooked until the next DLC pack drops. But here, in Injustice 2, it's encouraging me to learn a genre that I had previously deemed impenetrable. I haven't even mentioned the multiverse, a single-player mode with rotating challenges, loot rewards, alternate reality battles, and difficulty modifiers that keep things fresh from day to day. 
It's here where I spend most of my time because it crucially allows me to play how I want to play. I can remain at the same AI difficulty level, earn new gear, and complete new challenges without having to face AI or human opponents that far exceed my skills. It's here where I can play Injustice 2 at my own pace. Now, 10 hours later, I'm still playing Injustice 2 for the loot, but I'm also playing because I want to get better. I want to learn its complex systems, how they overlap, and how I can use them to my advantage. I want to become an expert with three or four characters, watch them change alongside my skills, and maybe even delve into the frame data available for each one. Time will tell if I actually get that far into it. But all this is to say that Injustice 2 uses accessibility to do something fantastic. It drew in someone unfamiliar with the genre, let me have fun however I wanted to, and encouraged me to go deeper. I'll say that again, it encouraged me to go deeper. It did not force me. It said, there is a lot more to this game than you're seeing at the moment, but you're having fun. And that's completely fine. Accessibility has become a largely negative term in recent years, as fans decry developers for supposedly dumbing down their favorite series. But I don't think accessibility has to be a bad thing. And the more people the video game industry attracts, the more diverse it becomes. And as diversity increases, both in the people making games and in us, the people playing them, the higher the chances are that we'll find great games to play. Games are only going to keep growing, and I think it's important, now more than ever, to figure out how to make them accessible without sacrificing quality or depth to convey complex mechanics and systems to people who aren't already well-versed in them. If it weren't for Injustice 2, I might not be looking forward to fighting games in the future, and I wouldn't be encouraging you to give them a try when they release. But here we are, and my fascination with fighting games has finally exceeded an outsider's interest. Injustice 2 is a complex game underneath, but on the surface, I'm going to keep having fun however I want to. You're getting shut down. Don't be so sure. 